Hello, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us today for our Pride Week. Um, I'm going to begin with, with the land acknowledgement. <clears throat> As this event is virtual, we are not all gathered in the same space. I recognize that this land acknowledgement might not be for the territory that you are currently on. We ask that if this is the case, you take the responsibility to acknowledge the traditional territory you are on and the current treaty holders. As a member of the York University community, I recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Tukoronto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabe Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. It is now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Metis communities. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. From what I understand, this land was appropriated by the British Crown in a series of deceitful treaties, most famously the Toronto Purchase of 1805, which cheated the Mississaugas out of a portion of this land for 10 shillings. What's more, a large portion of Toronto is unseated. For those of us who are settlers on this land, it's our collective responsibility to recognize that we are here because this land is occupied. In recognizing that this space occupies colonized First Nations territories, and out of respect for the sovereignty of Indigenous peoples, it is our collective responsibility to learn our colonial histories and their present day implications and continuities. It is also important to acknowledge that in addition to taking land and sovereignty from Indigenous nations, white settler colonialism has centrally involved imposing white ways of being and displacing diverse Indigenous ones. These colonial impositions include monogamous heterosexuality, the nuclear family structure, authoritarian, undemocratic, and physically violent means of wielding power between adults and children and between men and women and the binary gender system. They also include the imposition of capitalism, the racist and the classist criminal justice system, including the criminalization of sex work and drugs, the psychiatric system, which makes reasonable human suffering into into individual pathology and the practice of strangers deciding whether families and communities are safe for children and then forcibly removing them if the stranger decides that that's the best thing for the child. These are all everyday manifestations of ongoing colonialism, which we have a responsibility to both acknowledge and struggle against. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marvin. Um, Thank you, Marvin. Uh, <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Chapman. I am the faculty co-chair of SexGen New York. And my name is Jen Marshall, and I'm the student co-chair of SexGen New York. I use they, he pronouns. And I use they, them pronouns. <laughs> um, and we'd like to welcome you to uh, day two of a week of uh, very exciting events uh, that are happening with a number of very exciting speakers. Um, you think we'll be able to remember who they all are off the top of our head? I think, I think so, actually. So if you're tuning in uh, and you don't know about what's happening for the rest of the week, uh, tomorrow at the same time, so every day it's 11.30 to 1.00, uh, tomorrow at the same time, we're having a representative from YICO, which is a youth organization in Uganda, and Alex Rivers, uh, who is a local youth uh, uh, activist organizer person, uh, come and speak about their work. On Thursday, we're having uh, Lucayo Estrella and Cassandra Myers uh, speak. 
And on Friday, we're having Kusha Dadoy and um, Mocha Dawkins speak. Um, I will let Jin say a little bit about the event that's happening today. But before I do that, I'm going to say there are also at 2 p.m. every day, other than Friday, I think there are uh, um, supportive events being organized by the Center for Sexual Violence Support, Response, and Education um, for people who uh, would, uh, are interested. And I don't have the, the, the thing in front of me, but it is available on their website. And I bet someone will put it in the chat because I'm mentioning it. And uh, there's everything from um, uh, that one of the days is a session on mindfulness. Another day is uh, our therapy session. And there are also other things that are happening. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> Excellent. Today, um, today we're, we'll run out who's introducing and who's speaking, and then we'll pass it over to our first introducer of the day. Yes. Today, we have Hannah Shafi, Frizz Kids speaking, and Callie Banner introducing. And after that, we have Pri Rihal speaking and Jennifer Sabrina Ferdinand's introducing. Um, we welcome you. Yes, Chris. I was just going to say, Callie, who's going to speak as soon as we stop, is a member of the USA Equity Committee. Excellent. <laughs> uh, and we are grateful to begin. Yeah, we're very excited about today's yeah. event. And and thank you so excellent. much, everybody who's part of this. Thank you. Over to Callie. Thank you, Chris and Jen. I am very excited to be here. So I'm Kaylee, and I have the honor of introducing Hannah Shafi. Hannah Shafi is a writer and artist who illustrates under the name Frizz Kid. Both her visual art and writing frequently explores themes such as feminism, body politics, racism, and pop culture. She's published articles in publications such as The Walrus, Hazlitt, and this magazine and has been featured on BuzzFeed, CBC, Flair Magazine, New York Times, and Shameless. Known on Instagram for her weekly affirmation series, she is also the recipient of the Woman Who Inspire Award from the Canadian Council for Muslim Wiz Women in 2017. Her first book, It Begins With the Body, was selected by CBC Books as one of the best poetry books in 2018. Her second book, Small, Broke, and Kind of Dirty is in stores now. Please give a warm welcome to Hannah. And Hannah, thank you so much for being here today. Hello, hello. I'm so excited to be here. Um, so yeah, let's, let's get right into it. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm Hannah, AKA Frizz Kid. You can call me Frizz Kid or you can call me Hannah, it doesn't matter. Um, and I'm really excited to, to talk about community building through art. Um, and I kind of decided, well, instead of telling you about community building through art, we should actually engage in community building through art. So, um, and I mean, I think that the that community building through art essentially happens through storytelling and that um, all forms of art, whether it's visual art, dancing, singing, um, writing, they're all forms of storytelling essentially. And that's how we build community and we create connections and that's how oral histories are passed down. That's how we break barriers and develop uh, empathy for one another is, is through storytelling. And so I thought, okay, well, I should do some storytelling then. So I'm gonna do a bit of reading from uh, my second book, Small Broke and Kind of Dirty. Um, and I specifically picked a couple of essays in it that were about community and resistance and, uh, you know, the power of resisting oppressive structures and the power of civil disobedience. Um, but before I do that, I wanted to share a personal story of when I sort of realized that building community through art was really possible. And it was when I, there's an organization called Certain Days 
they do like advocacy work and fundraising for political prisoners. And they had reached out to me and a, and a ton of other artists to uh, submit art to a calendar, a calendar that was gonna be raising awareness about political prisoners and uh, that was going to be fundraising for some of their legal fees. And so I had I'd, uh, given a piece of my affirmation art and I got a message from one of the organizers who had, was relaying to me a letter that they had received from a political prisoner who is currently um, in uh, the prison system in America and who's been experiencing a lot of abuse and being forced into solitary confinement. And he had sent me a message to say that, um, that, well, he said, I, I don't know if you have contact with the artists, but the work by Frisk Kid made me tear up so powerful and real and needed. And honestly, that, I mean, it blew me away because I didn't think that, I knew that community building through art was possible, but I didn't, I had no idea that art could possibly give someone who was being so terrorized and abused by the prison system a feeling of, of hope and, and power. Um, and it made me realize even more the importance of how art is such a tool for resistance and such a tool for breaking down these structures. Um, getting that message totally changed my life. I couldn't believe that, that it had had that impact on him. Um, and I'm not gonna like, obviously I know about who the person is. I'm just not gonna say like who they are for their own privacy reasons, but, um, but yeah, like it, it was just an incredible experience and um, it could, made me feel more committed to art as a political tool, art as a tool of resistance, art as a way to form bonds with people no matter how far away they are or if they're literally behind bars and, and, and being stolen away from society like that. So yeah, I wanted to start with that and I, I hope that you know, all of you realize that you have the power to create those kinds of connections with people and that those connections are vital and it's what keeps us going. Okay, let's start. So this is from uh, the second chapter of the book. I think so. It's the second chapter called On Politics. Oh, also, if the organizers could give me a little heads up, uh, if I'm going over time, just write it in the chat, that'd be great. <laughs> At the first Women's March in January 2017, I held a sign that said, fuck fascism. I'll admit it wasn't my most eloquent work. I'd hurriedly scribbled it on the cardboard before skipping a class and running to the march with my friend. But even though I made that sign at the last minute, I was deliberate with my choice of words. I meant what I said, and I felt strongly that it needed saying amid all the pink pussy hats, the catchy slogans, the I'm with her pins, the unabashed cis-normative white capitalist feminism. Yes, this was a women's march, and yes, it was about misogyny. One catalyst for the event was Donald Trump's comments that blatantly encouraged the sexual assault of women. But I felt it was about so much more than that, because at its core, misogyny is not a standalone issue. It intersects with racism, ableism, classism, colonialism, homophobia, transphobia, and more. And when we see our world leaders getting away with misogynistic behavior, it is an indicator of a larger problem brewing under the surface, the rise of fascism. The other signs of fascism have arisen too, like suppression of the media, activists and scientists, framing a group of people as the other who pose a threat, heightened security and surveillance of the public, increases in police brutality, intense militaristic nationalism, and a lot of money and power in the hands of the very few. In 2018, the province of Ontario, where I live, 
elected Doug Ford as its premier. He's Canada's very own version of Trump. And I knew his election was going to bring out some scary things. In 2017, Statistics Canada reported that there had been a 47% increase in hate crimes since 2009, a figure undoubtedly correlated with the 2016 election of Donald Trump, who has received support from prominent white nationalists. White supremacy has always been alive and well in Canada and the United States, but it's now becoming increasingly more visible and hostile. When I received hate comments online in the days before Trump and Ford, they were from anonymous douchebags with the profile picture of an anime girl with mega giant boobs. These days, I get truly hateful messages from people who proudly display their full name. I can easily check out their profile. I can see their friends, their workplace, their family. This isn't a lapse on their part or an act of stupidity. It's still a Brit. They know these ideologies have become normalized, that our elected leaders have given white supremacists a pass to be out in the open. A lot of this has made me angry. The apathy towards it has made me angry. The argument that there are two sides to the story makes me angry. When the other side believes in the eradication of so-called inferior races, I don't care to hear their version of the story. When I attended a midnight rally in September 2018 at Queen's Park, the provincial legislature in Toronto, I, was all, I also knew that I was protesting fascism. Ostensibly, we were there to speak out against cuts. Premier Ford was set to slash the number of Toronto City Councillors in half. This meant that dozens of communities would be underserved and would have a harder time voicing their concerns. This would undeniably have a disproportionate impact on lower income racialized communities, as well as people with disabilities and or living on welfare. It's already hard for those on the margins to get justice in the system, and this would make accountability even less accessible. A reduced number of public servants trying to serve a huge number of people in a rapidly gentrified city that's in the grips of a homelessness and opioid crisis spells disaster. Ford also removed rent control on new buildings in Toronto, an already too expensive city that is becoming harder to survive in by the day. Making matters worse, he was putting the city councillor measure through at midnight on a Sunday, so the majority of the working public would be unable to attend in protest. Still, 200 of us showed up. It was not nearly enough, but at least we were there. I was among the first to arrive and was able to get a seat in the public viewing gallery. It didn't last. Some of my fellow protesters got reasonably emotional and they began heckling Doug Ford, who actually chuckled as an elderly woman told him how much he was hurting the city. We were all kicked out. Once outside, we began chanting, let us in. We refused to be shut out of the democratic process, which was no longer looking quite so democratic. We banged on a wooden barricade that was up for some construction on the property. And by we, I mean all of us, young adults, children, elderly people, families. Inside the provincial parliament, members of the opposition parties asked for a moment of silence so they could hear the angry public outside. Ford's party members clapped over that moment to drown us out. The next day, I was asked to go on CBC Radio, Canada's national broadcaster, to talk about the protest. The host asked me why we were banging on the barricades, making a commotion. Because we just wanted them to hear us, I said. It's as simple as that sometimes. The first sign of fascism is when the people pushing you down clap over your cries for justice. And all you really want is for them to hear you, to see you to see the devastating impact their policies are having on your life, on the lives of thousands, and to hold them accountable while they shamelessly look away. I don't believe in civil obedience when it comes to fighting fascism. I do believe in the public's right to be angry. I believe in our right to be heard. And I believe in the power of civil disobedience if that's what it takes to achieve this. Because as we stood in the cold at 2 a.m., our numbers dwindling, I realized how easy it was for them to shut the door on us. 
When we look to history for lessons on the dismantling of fascism, we find that the stories of success are rooted in acts of disobedience. These successes have come via sit-ins, rioting, screaming, striking, shutting down intersections, inconveniencing people for a moment, and questioning what civility even looks like in the face of people who refuse to or maybe can't see our humanity. I often feel a deep sense of hopelessness when I think about these things, but I try to remember that community building and care and kindness are truly the greatest acts of resistance. Fascism thrives on our apathy, hopelessness, and isolation. Imagine if we had hope and were radically empathetic Imagine caring for our communities and our families and friends and proving that we can't be divided or made to feel hopeless. Imagine that we keep banging on the barricades and demanding to be heard. And imagine being louder than the people who try to drown us out. And then take a moment to realize that we don't have to imagine any of this. Like so many activists all over the world, young and old, we can do these things. In fact, we need to do these things because life as we know it is going to disappear if we allow divisiveness, hate, violence, corporate greed, and the pillaging of all of our natural resources to continue. We can do these hopeful things and we must. Okay. So I'm gonna read Another one, again, it's about community building, essentially. Um, and this was a really great experience for me and it helped me feel closer to community and it helped me feel closer to the, the new generation, the young people who are doing so much great work. And I think that um, we should be supporting them. All right, let's keep it going. To keep the momentum going. My favorite part of the St. Catherine's Climate Strike Rally, which took place September 27th, 2019, in conjunction with the global climate strike, was a young boy who took the stage. These kids were eager to get on the mic and not for selfish purposes. It was clear they really cared about climate justice. And fair enough, it's their future that looks the most bleak after all, and many of them are currently suffering from an existential dread that no child should ever have to contend with. Most of us didn't grow up wondering if we were going to make it to adulthood. Anyway, this one kid got on the mic and went off on a clumsy rant about the use of plastic. Plastic, what even is this? What the heck? It sounded silly, but he had amazing insights. He pointed out that there are many biodegradable alternatives to plastic. So many, in fact, that there is no good reason why so much of this stuff should be ending up in the ocean. We have the science, the innovative brain, brain power to create biodegradable alternatives that wouldn't harm ocean life. Part of my reaction to this kid's talk was weirdly maternal. Oh, look at that sweet little child. I must protect him. But the other part was a bit of sadness. When I was a child, I wasn't thinking about the ills of pollution. Sure, we learned about recycling in school and loving the planet and not being a litter bug, but we were unaware that as we lived in blissful ignorance, the planet was being degraded and that it was only a matter of time before the degradation became irreversible. I was in St. Catharines for a mini art show I was doing at a cafe owned by a friend of a friend. Bummed that I was missing the Toronto climate strike, I asked my friend if anything was happening locally. Before she could even get back to me, I got a message from one of the organizers. They'd learned I was going to be in town for the show and asked if I would speak for a few minutes at the rally. I jumped at the opportunity. I even had a poem I'd written about climate justice that I was prepared to read. And my poem was cool and all, but this kid musing over a piece of plastic garbage he found on the ground loudly exclaiming, what the heck, over and over, was 10 times better than anything I have ever written. And the fact that he never said hell or damn, not even once, just added to the freaking wholesome nature of the entire thing. Kids had skipped school to attend this strike. I looked at my friends. Why didn't we do that stuff, I asked. 
we didn't know. It's true to a degree. I was in high school when Stephen Harper was prime minister and his government put gags on a lot of Canada's climate scientists. These educated, intelligent, aware human beings weren't permitted to speak out on the dangers of prioritizing profit over the well-being of our planet. What if they'd been free to sound off? Would we have been organizing strikes and marches too? I want to believe that we would have, but I'm not so sure. It was a different time. We didn't have today's young activists to look up to, the Autumn Peltiers and Greta Thunbergs. Kids today are lucky and unlucky. Lucky that they have role models like this to galvanize them in the first place. Oh, galvanize them. But unlucky that there's a need to be galvanized in the first place. When I was around the age of the young boy who took the mic, my biggest concern was whether I was going to miss the latest episode of That's So Raven. I thought the height of activism was carrying that little UNICEF box when we went trick-or-treating on Halloween. My anxiety centered on getting whipped in the face by a jump rope during double dutch at recess. And we were angriest at the school administration when they banned Red Rover because some kid in another school had apparently broken his arm while playing. When I first skipped school, it was to go to the mall, and I felt super guilty after. This is the simpleness of childhood. It's not that I didn't think about complicated things growing up or that I had the perfect life. It's just that I didn't worry about the possibility of a non-existent future. I dreamed without concern of what the world would look like in my 20s and 30s. I assumed it would only get better, that progress would always march forward that we would never take steps back. Now I have legitimate dread about the future. My friends and I joke, what's the point of saving for a home when we're going to be living in a post-apocalyptic hellscape anyways? It is easy to let climate apathy overtake you. It's easy to wonder if there's any point in fighting. Rent is too high. Wages haven't matched the inflation of the cost of living. The world is burning. Fanboys ruined the magic of Star Wars, and Cats was the scariest movie ever made. So what's the point of living? I have two reasons to keep on keeping on. One is spite. I refuse to let the inaction and greed of the world's richest, many of whom are decrepit old white men beginning to resemble the Crypt Keeper and Jeff wannabe Lex Loser Bezos, be the reasons I give up. How can we allow our beautiful planet and our lives to be ruined by a group of gross resource hoarding guys and the wealthy women who are undoubtedly complicit? The answer is that we can't. I am too spiteful for that shit. I hold grudges. The second reason is the little boy at the climate march. Maybe I'm jaded, but he shouldn't have to be jaded. Even though he was concerned, he was also a child with a tremendous amount of hope. After the rally, as my friends and I walked to the local deli to get lunch, we couldn't help but repeat his words. Plastic, what the heck? It was like a war cry. We were angry for him. We felt his frustration and absolutely had to or else nothing would get done. If he was angry, we had the responsibility to make his anger echo, to get other people upset too because a dying planet is worth getting upset over. If you can't feel rage over the, the deliberate pillaging of the planet, what then? If the cries of children who worry that they may never see their adulthood don't worry you, what will? If you're apathetic about your future, don't be apathetic about his. Perhaps the reason we millennials are where we are is the apathy of the generations before us. I know Generation Z can be annoying with all their TikToks and confusing lingo. I know sometimes you just wanna yell, get off my lawn, you damn teenagers, which I almost did when some hooligan 16 year olds were being annoying outside of my apartment. But it's worth remembering that they're also more aware of the ills of the world than many of us were at their age and seemingly more willing to do something about it. Maybe that excuses a bit of hooliganism now and again. It's like that iconic Simpsons episode where Homer changes Mr. Burns' ominous workplace message from don't forget you're here forever to do it for her with the her in question being his daughter Maggie. 
take a tip from Homer and do it for that little boy who doesn't understand what the fucking point of plastic is. Do it for him. Okay. How am I doing on time? Am I doing okay? Should I read another one or? I think you're doing great. Oh yeah, yeah. Kaylee, you go. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking Hannah, we have about five more minutes so I would okay. love to hear another one, yeah. I'll read one more. And this one, we're talking about community building. So going to talk about friendship because I think friendship is a big part of community building. I used to think that, girl, that girlhood was a competition. I used to think that being a woman was akin to taking part in the Hunger Games, that we were all fighting so desperately for survival that it was every woman for herself. I used to resent other girls as an adolescent. I used to think other girls were vapid and shallow and that it was okay if I was ugly because I was intelligent and they were brainless. This is how I used to think when I was growing up. I was horribly insecure about the way I looked. I was not popular. I was not well liked by boys and I didn't know what to do with these feelings. So I did what society has told all of us young girls to do. I competed with every girl in sight. According to the rules of the game I was playing without ever questioning why I was playing it, I was 15 years old after all, another girl could not thrive because doing so would mean she was stamping out my bloom. Where did I get this crazy idea? It's what we're all shown. Betty and Veronica are always competing for Archie's love in the comics and on Riverdale. Lizzie competes with Kate for Ethan Craft's love in Lizzie McGuire. Raven's tormentors are always popular girls on That's So Raven. Regina George is an evil bitch who backstabs Katie to get to Aaron Samuels. Do these references give away how much of a millennial I am? And how utterly screwed it is that this is the messaging that little girls grow up on? frenemies, cat fights, women who don't play well with other women. We are raised to internalize every bit of this. Reality though is different. Yes, there are mean girls and there are women who bully other women. But when I was busy thinking of other girls as my competition and when all the other girls I knew were doing the same thing, boys were walking all over us. Boys were calling us ugly. Boys were calling us bitches. Boys were rating girls with numbers. Boys were spreading slut-shaming rumors. Boys were calling every disagreement between two girls a cat fight. Boys and their bro groups, which by the way, were heralded for having less drama than female friendship circles, had that kind of camaraderie because they actually had plenty of examples of male camaraderie to pull from. Every boy group was the A-Team or the Hardy Boys or Ocean's Eleven or the Justice League or Holmes and Watson, the Three Musketeers, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, Maverick and Goose, Batman and Robin, the Goonies, the Lost Boys, you name it. This is why girl friendships are so important because each one subverts the idea that we are all in competition with each other, that we can't all grow, that we can't all be successful or desired or worthy. Girl friendships are vital. They're revolutionary. Don't be that woman who says she's not like other girls and can't befriend other women because there's just too much drama. The drama in question here is just internalized misogyny. Patriarchy is the drama, my dude. When a group of boys has their friendship destroyed or their group falls apart in some way or another, it's never blamed on the drama of the boys. Nope, it's blamed on the girlfriend, the woman who comes in to infiltrate and destroy, the Yoko Ono, the Courtney Love. Newsflash, there is enough room for all of us, enough resources for all of us if we take them and demand them instead of allowing a racist patriarchy to adopt only a few of us as meaningless tokens of diversity. Why are we Betty and Veronica fighting over Archie when we could all be Destiny's Child or the Spice Girls or insert current example so I seem more cultured with the times? Oh, I just thought of one, the She-Ra reboot. When we submit to the notion of the competition, we allow ourselves to fight in the gladiator stadium for everyone else's entertainment rather than nurture, nurture each other for our own growth and well-being. 
don't be Lizzie and Kate when they fight over Ethan. Why not be that episode when they make Latvian food together and laugh and have fun in a cute montage? Stop pointing your weapons at each other. Instead, point them at the white supremacist patriarchy and tear that shit down. Thank you. Hannah, oh my goodness. Thank you so much for reading those pieces. I, it's hard enough to do that. So I commend you so much. And those references are excellent. I felt them. I was laughing the whole time. Um, your way of uh, blending hard truths with humor is just so beautiful. And it's so conversational. Like, I feel like you're sitting right beside me reading that out. And I feel like if I read the book, I'd feel the I'm same. glad you feel that way. Because that's the point of how storytelling makes people feel close to each other. No, that was beautiful. That's the goal. I was amazing. <laughs> you did it. Um, so we have a couple of questions uh, in the chat here. So I'll read them out to you. Um, but the first one I am also want to know is where can we find your book? Okay, you can find my book a few places. One, I have a website. It's frizzkidart.com. I'll put it in the chat. I sell my book. But you can also get my book from some amazing independent bookstores like Glad Day Bookshop, which is the oldest LGBTQ bookstore in North America. You can get it from Queen Books. You can get it from uh, another, another story bookshop. Um, you can, obviously it's available on uh, the Indigo website as well. So if you're in a more uh, rural area, a little bit further away from any small bookshops, you can also order it from Indigo. Um, yeah. Cool, thank you. And uh, so, yeah, so you can link your website below. That'd be awesome. And any social media too would be great. And uh, we have another question, which I also want to know is, where did you get the name Frizz Kid? The name Frizz Kid is because I have frizzy hair. I love it. That's That's it. Awesome. I have big frizzy hair. I was like, you know what? I'm just going to be Frizz Kid. And also because I just always feel like a child at heart and I don't, I don't want to grow up. So <laughs> That's awesome. I, when I was in high school, I would flatten my hair using a flat iron. Me too. Me yeah. too. I had pin straight hair. Yeah. I damaged the shit out of my hair. I am never doing that again. Yeah. Your hair is beautiful. So please Thank don't. <laughs> um, okay. So, ah, your weekly affirmation series mentioned in your bio, where can people see that? So my weekly affirmation series is on Instagram or on my Frizz Kid Facebook page. And I basically, generally, I'll put out a piece of affirmation art every Monday on my social media. Every now and then I'll skip a Monday because I'm burnt out and I don't want to, uh, you know, do anything. But that's basically where you can find it, is on my Instagram. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And so we have a multi-part question. So I'll, I'll read the whole question, but I can piece it uh, as we go. So... How can we recognize art as activism? How is it different and how can we support? Well, there's lots of instances of art as activism. The really obvious ones is all the great signs that you see at protests or the posters that go around with calls to action are the really obvious ways of how we create art as activism because they have a message that they're trying to get out and they're trying to galvanize people. And the thing is um, creating art that draws people to certain issues is really powerful because issues, the big issues of the world are complicated. They're very complicated. And, you know, you can read academic journals and long essays and books and everything about them, which I encourage people to do. But how do you get people to even create an interest in those issues? How do you get people to feel galvanized that they can do something about it? How do you get them to want to dig deeper and that's through art um i've seen beautiful art about certain issues that i didn't really know about and it pushed me to actually learn about it so for example um i didn't know what juneteenth was until i saw a really gorgeous piece of juneteenth art and i thought this is beautiful and i want to know more about this and it made me go and look it up and learn about it so art is really cool it's a stepping stone for a lot of people to get engaged in those matters but also it's a political tool i mean 
you can look at the really obvious like political cartoons, but people make art to call out politicians, to bring attention to the injustices. We use art, we use symbols to create that. When you look at things like, for example, the pride flags and these symbols that we use, it just started off as someone creating a piece of art, right? And then that symbol galvanized an entire, people like to rally behind symbols. They like to rally behind visual art. And that's why often when we look at the history of fascism, art gets extremely suppressed because these leaders know that art has tremendous power, that sharing art with people that uplifts them, especially art that uplifts marginalized people has the power, right? Because their goal is to make marginalized people feel hopeless. When we see, think of it as like when you're watching a movie and it moves you, it absolutely just moves you. You listen to a song and it moves you. That's the power. And we can use that as activism. Like you look at a band like Rage Against the Machine. Rage Against the Machine made protest music and it, and it got people to rally behind them and rally behind important causes like police brutality. Um, so yeah, I think that's, that's how we can recognize art as activism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, that was, that's beautiful. You provided so many great examples and so many different medias. Mm -hmm. um, and so the last question is how can we support? And I, I see your book specifically of having a lot of kind of comforting humor, but also direct calls to action. So if you wanted to maybe talk about that. How it can support. Um, first of all, if you have the financial means to donate to causes that you care about, please do. You see a lot of uh, things online of mutual aid request support. Um, if you have the means to uh, financially redistribute, you should absolutely do that. But if not, there's lots of different ways to support. You can support creators who are doing that work of getting these issues and these messages out there. You know, anything is from following them on social media and supporting them, sending them kind messages. I mean, some of the people who are doing really powerful work on social media, they get a lot of hate messages and they get a lot of negativity. And sometimes it just means a lot to tell someone that the work they're doing is making a difference um, because it helps them keep going. And the other way to support though, I think is about nurturing our interpersonal relationships. We like to think of activism as this really distant thing, but activism and resistance really starts with our own personal relationships. So mm -hmm. taking care of your community, being there for your friends, your loved ones, building a chosen family around you where you all support each other, even at your lowest moments, this is a form of support, right? So the large forms of support are obviously donate to those causes, show up to the protest, uh, amplify these messages, support marginalized creators, local creator, local creators that are doing this great work, put money in their pockets so that they can continue doing great work, you know, share credible articles, sign petitions, speak to your family, but also nurture the relationships around you. Healthy communities cannot be stomped out. When we take care of our community, we blossom, we thrive, and the people who try to hold us down are less likely to do it because we're connected. They thrive on dividing communities apart and keeping people isolated. Yes, amazing, thank you. And you really cannot underestimate the power of collective action. Absolutely. Yeah, that's awesome, thank you so much. Um, there's another question here that is basically asking for a room tour. So I'll oh. read it. <laughs> Are there any images behind you right now that you'd like to highlight for us and connect in any way to the relationship between art and struggles for social justice or oh any my other? My. Yeah. What an interesting question. Oh, <laughs> I mean, I, uh, a lot of my stuff in the background is honestly just like nerdy pop culture stuff, but I did create um, some, I, I decorated my apartment with some pride decorations and there's one in particular that I really like. Okay, well, I'll try to show you. So this one up here says a cab. Oh, amazing. In the bisexual flag colors <laughs> representation. And this one says um, no cops. No cops at Pride mm -hmm. in rainbow flag colors. Woohoo! Um, and so, actually, like, you know, there are a lot of pieces here that are by small creators and small artists. Um, and I think that's like super important, right? Is like helping the people around you and your, in your community. So, like, there's a lot of 
people on here that are like literally from Toronto or in Canada that I bought art from and it makes me happy to have their things on my wall and yeah I want to put money in the pockets of uh, small creators because that's important we got to get them to thrive we don't need to like buy decorations from like urban outfitters or shit let's 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 buy from small creators yes I love that so much thank you so much and thank you for sharing your work really appreciate it and the Q&A amazing work I think we might uh pause and take a break now but yeah. I really appreciate this Hannah thank, thank you so you. much bye Thank you. Thank you so much, Hannah, aka Fizz Kid, um, and Callie for, you know, leading the discussion. Um, and Fizz Kid has just uh, entered their website in the, in the chat, so you can check that out. Um, Jin or Chris, are we going for a 10 minute or a break? Yes, we will be having a short break now. Okay. We'll be back okay. in probably five to 10 minutes, probably seven minutes, let's say seven. Okay, sounds good.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Um, I will begin by introducing Jennifer Fernandez, who will then uh, sort of introduce our next speaker. Um, Jennifer, I'll give it to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to introduce Pri Riel. Pri is an artist educator currently based in Toronto, originally from Jogjage. They're a child of immigrant settlers from Punjab. Pri's work is an ode to their extended youth as a trans and non-binary person, while also painting love letters to their inner child and affirming their queer, disabled, fat self. Their main medium is watercolor, but Pri also embroiders, creates short films, writes and performs drag. They have an interdisciplinary arts practice under the name Sticky Mangoes and co-founded the Non-Binary Color Collective. Pri's work has been featured in CBC, Extra Magazine, Blog TO, and Salty. Welcome, Pri. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Marvin and everyone for getting us started this morning. Um, it's really nice seeing Hannah, who's a good friend through community. And so, yeah, I'm really excited to be here today. Um, I'm just gonna start my little timer here so that it keeps me on check for time. I'm gonna move this back over here. Okay, so, oops. Let me bring this back over here. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so my name is Pri um, and uh, like Jennifer mentioned, I'm a, an artist here, um, now based in Toronto, and I'm excited to talk to you all a little bit about community building through art online and um, in times like the pandemic and also in real life. So um, yeah, I have uh, an arts practice called um, it goes under the name of Sticky Mangoes. Um, and like mentioned in the intro, I do a lot of different things. Um, if you want to check out some of my drag stuff, I'll be doing a performance for, uh, that's a part of one of the Pride events called Brown Out uh, this Friday at, I think, 6 or 7 p.m. Um, you can find that stuff on my Instagram, which is um, Sticky Mangoes or under Gay Ramasala, which is my drag persona. But yeah, if you just wanted to check out some other fun things for Pride this week, um, yeah, and this is kind of what I have planned for us today. Um, rather than telling you how to engage in community building, I thought I would share a little bit about, you know, how I did it and to see if maybe you have questions about that process um, and kind of sharing some of the wins, but also the challenges. And so I'll be talking about coming into myself through community arts and community building, talking about the pandemic and creating alone, but together and then also talking through an example of like a project um, that didn't, um, I guess, manifest in the way that I had planned, um, but talking about how um, I pivoted it into something else after a few different iterations. Um, but yeah, I feel like a lot of times when there are artist talks or, um, I don't know, just um, presentations like this, oftentimes we kind of share the highlight reel, right? Very much like just like public facing things. And so I want to kind of be transparent about an example of where things didn't really work out. Uh, and I feel like that's just as important as the wins. I'm just going to wait a minute to see if the interpreter needs any time to catch up. All good. Cool. I know I talk really fast, so just give me a shout if anything. Um, yeah. And so I feel like my art artist process is very intertwined with my coming out process. It's very tied to my queerness and my transness and also that extended youth piece that I talk about in my bio uh, that was in the intro. And what that means for me is that oftentimes when you see queer and trans people in the media, they are usually folks that are white, who are able-bodied, who are skinny, a lot of times they're twinks. And um, I don't know, they'll either be on like a talk show or a TV show and they'll be like 10 years old and, you know, already on puberty blockers and um, their parents are like, congratulations on coming out, here's a cake. And 
that was very much not my experience. And I feel like not the experience of a lot of racialized folks either. And um, so for me, I grew up in a Punjabi household. And what that looked like was that um, we didn't really talk about gender or sexuality or sex or assigned sex or gender expression or any of those things. And, um, you know, my content warning for passing of a parent, I'll just be briefly mentioning. Um, my dad passed away when we were really young and I, being like a very protective Scorpio, took it upon myself to kind of become um, the parent figure for my little sibling and kind of like being there for my mom in a very like, um, I guess, protective way. And being in that parental role for my little sibling very much informed a lot of my like teenage years and early 20s. Like I was the person that was going to the parent teacher meetings and things like that, because we have an almost 10 year age gap, my little sibling and I, and they were only six when my dad passed away. And my mom was having a really hard time with just like the, the loss itself and having to go back to work after grieving and whatnot. And so I, I kind of like fell out of things that I enjoyed and I was very much living a life of um, things that I had to do or things that I was expected to do um, in this kind of very adult role. And um, I ended up kind of like stumbling into going into an undergrad, stumbling into grad school. And I know that that sounds kind of weird, but the reason why I say I kind of fell into those things is that um, I wasn't raised in like one of those families, which is oftentimes a narrative when we like see brown people in the media of like, you have to grow up and be a doctor or an engineer or a lawyer. Um, I didn't grow up in a family like that. Uh, I grew up very working class. Um, my parents were working class. And so there was no expectation of like um, higher education or anything like that. And so um, I actually tried going to college and I hated it. And that's how I ended up um, back in university for grad school upon the suggestion of one of my profs, actually at York. Um, so shout out to York for fully funding my master's because I couldn't have done it otherwise. And um, after that, I went um, out to Montreal to kind of like, just like live on my own without my family. My sibling was 18. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna try to like do things for myself for a bit. Um, and it was really fun. I, I ended up really enjoying it, but I really missed my sibling. I missed my partner. And I ended up coming back to Toronto to do my PhD. And this was about three or four years ago. For a lot of different reasons, I, I, had, I had to withdraw from the PhD. I realized that it, it wasn't actually the right step for me at that time. Um, and I ended up at the recommendation of my little sibling. Uh, we're really close. And my little sibling was like, hey, I know that you've been like working really hard on you know, teaching and academia and stuff, but like, why don't you do something fun? Like you used to really love art when you were little. And I saw this cool program about making zines, you know, why don't you apply for it? And I was like, okay, I, I, I don't know if I, if I'm allowed to, but I'll, I'll like, I'll, I'll apply for it. I don't really know about these things. And yeah, so I applied for this zine making program and it was right around the same time as um, I had learned about the word non-binary and I was still kind of socially coming out as a trans person and I had just gotten comfortable in my queerness um, like not too many years prior. And so there I was a baby queer in a mid twenties body, um, a baby trans. And um, I walked into, I applied for this program. I got in to learn how to make zines and it was hosted at Paper House Studio which is a paper making studio um, near Trinity Bellwoods in the Artscape Young Place building. And Paper House is really like the foundation of how I found my people. Prior to um, applying for that program and meeting the participants in it, I had always been someone that felt very isolated. I never really understood when people were like, blood is thicker than water, family over everything. Um, because I didn't really have that. I didn't have extended family like a lot of brown folks do. Um, and I didn't have like a big group of friends. I was always really awkward. Much later in life, I was diagnosed with um, being autistic and that made a lot of sense of things. But yeah, I just, I never really understood how people had these big groups of friends, how they maintained that, um, how they felt so good about being around people all the time. And I know that sounds kind of funny because I do a lot of public speaking, but it was really just 
I, I was having a really hard time with that even into my early 20s because even all throughout undergrad, I had my one friend and like, we just like took all the same classes together and we were like, we will like, we'll make it with each other. I've always been one of those people that just has like the one friend. Anyway, so I walk into Paper House, baby queer, baby trans, um, still kind of learning into my, my identity as being a disabled person as well. And the people that I met in that program changed my life. And some of the ways that they changed my life is that for example, when I had my um, chest reduction last year, like they were the people who checked on me and made, like brought me meals. Um, when I move, they're the folks who come and help with um, the heavy lifting or, you know, helping to pay for things. Um, during the pandemic, we've been sending each other letters and being pen pals. Um, and so just to give you an example that these are the people that are like very much um, my family now. And finding that group of people um, really taught me what community is and really made me want to do more community building. Because prior to that, I was like, I don't really get it. I've never really met like my people. Um, and so I think I would say that for me, the first step of learning about community and how to community build is finding your people. And I think that one of the easiest ways to do that is by um, finding a common interest because then you already have something to talk about. Uh, and so for me, in this case, it was like crafting um, and just like learning about zines. And one of the other big takeaways that I, I learned at Paper House was from the co-directors, the co-owners of Paper House, who are Flora and Emily. And Flora taught me and taught us that one of the biggest things is that artists can and should deserve to be paid. And not only do they deserve to be paid something that we deserve to be paid really fairly. And so that is something that I've also carried into, um, I guess, my life and where I am now, uh, as I've started to like maintain an art practice more seriously. Um, through um, my time at Paper House, Flora connected me with the archives, uh, formerly known as the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives of Canada. I think that was the the name of it, um, but now it's called Archives. I did a zine making workshop for them. And then after that, I wrote a piece for Salty Magazine. Um, and then I worked for Toronto Crew Film Festival and I, I taught a zine making workshop there. And then I went on to do a bunch of different things, including like co-founding the Non-Binary Color Collective with another artist. And um, I got spotlighted and received a really wonderful um, pandemic artist grant from the AGO. I got to teach a workshop for staff at Entertainment One on Pride. I got to teach workshops and actually co-taught a workshop with Hanaf, um, first kid at Toronto Public Libraries. Um, I got featured um, in the CBC. I got to work with clients like the Gay Men's Sexual Health Alliance, with Scatting Court Community Center, with LGBT Youth Line. And these are just a few. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to give you kind of this like quick picture of where I started and how I got here. And also that you can, you can start and change the trajectory of your life at, at different points in your life. You know, um, I know that I'm not that old. I'm turning 30 this year, but I feel like kind of picking a completely different career, dropping out of your PhD at, at 27 is kind of, it's kind of a bold thing to do, you know, if I may say so myself. And It looks like the interpreter's caught up. Awesome, you're so fast. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to give you this idea that like you totally can do the thing and you totally can and should be paid for this. All of these examples of like work and clients that I've given you are all, all, are all paying opportunities. Um, I also went on to do this program called Artworks TO. I'm not being paid by them, but I, I really like this program. I think they're taking applications right now. And through this program, you get to take OCAD courses for free. You get to work with a client. You get four thousand dollars for your for the work that you do for the client, regardless of what your contract is. And you also get to attend some mentorship programs. So if you're someone that's like, I really want to like get into community arts or being an artist, I'd really recommend checking out Artworks Tio. They're also doing some. Um, build your portfolio workshops, I think this week and next week. So check those out. And these are some other organizations that I've had the pleasure of working with and for as well. Um, and so, yeah, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. And I wanna share this tweet um, by this person from um, that I found on Twitter. 
well, it's a tweet, so obviously I found it on Twitter, but you know what I'm trying to say. Um, and they said, creatives, some of you are holding your gifts hostage due to perfectionism. We spend so much time worrying about adding endless tweaks at the expense of delaying the project. We worry so much about who will like it and will it be accepted? Release your gift. The world needs it. I love this so much because people always ask me like, Pri, how do you do the thing? And I'm just like, you just post your art even when it's garbage. <laughs> like, I'm not someone that is formally trained. Like I said, I just like, I joined this scene making program and I was like, I like this and I want to do this. And yeah, so like I, if you gave me a picture of someone and if you told me to recreate it, it would definitely not look anything like the person, you know? Um, I just moved so I don't have any art behind me, but um, you can see my stuff online and you'll see that a lot of it is very like, I don't know, it taps more into like childlike joy or like more political statements. Um, I either want you to feel something good about it or I want it to just be like a spicy feeling if you're a bigot, you know? But um, yeah, I just like my advice to anyone that's like looking to kind of start out, and, you know, even if it's just in terms of building community, it's just like, just start and just try to do the thing. And I feel like that's the hardest step, you know? Um, and yeah, so I hope that that's something that you're able to carry on with you um, after this presentation as well. I don't know why this bar keeps popping up on the bottom, apologies. Um, but yeah, and I also wanted to share this idea um, of coming into yourself. It's a quote from um, Professor Alex Wilson, and it says, in my own research with Cree and Ojibwe Two-Spirit people, I heard many stories of coming in. Coming in does not center on the Declaration of Independence that characterizes coming out in the mainstream depictions of the lives of LGBTQI people. Rather, coming in is an act of returning fully present into ourselves to resume our place as a valued part of our families, our cultures, our communities and lands in connection with all of our relations. And I feel like this process of you know, coming back to Toronto, being with my sibling, um, who is now my roommate, um, coming back to my partner here, who's my best friend, and finding community that all kind of started at Paper House, and we all keep in touch still, and continue to work on projects and be there for each other. I feel like my experience of coming out and finding community is very much this, and not so much, you're gay, here's a cake. Um, and is not so much about, you know, waving a TD bank flag at Pride. And I hope that this kind of provides some context and maybe some answers for some feelings you might be having this Pride Month as well. Um, and also for folks that are celebrating Indigenous History Month as well. Um, yeah, and so that's a little bit about my process. Um, I'm noticing that I'm running a little bit low on time, so I'm gonna speed through the rest of this a little bit. But in terms of the pandemic and creating alone, but together, I can share that I kind of started by early in the pandemic, I think it was like March or April, I was feeling very alone. I was feeling very much like I was missing art spaces where I could just go hang out with people and make things. And so I started the quarantine art challenge so that folks could like make art and then share it. Um, these are some of the things that I made during that time. And these were some of the ones that I made for certain prompts. Like this was for stretch and it's like me doing my cat cow stretches that my chiropractor always yells at me to do. And um, you can find some of the, um, like an archive of what people posted for the quarantine art challenge on my Instagram page, if you wanna go check it out. And these are also some examples of things folks posted. Like I was so mind blown that people had so many different ways to interpret all the different prompts. And it made me feel so connected even though we were like in lockdown. Um, Natty Tremblay, who is an amazing educator and activist, did like performance videos. Uh, Shawnee, who is a poet, um, did these really amazing poems based on each prompt. Um, Ty, who's an, a really amazing multidisciplinary artist, is also my drag parent, um, did makeup looks and also a painting based on the prompts. And so, yeah, it made me feel really connected. And I feel like um, oftentimes, you know, virtual activism and virtual community building is criticized for being armchair activism, but I think that it's something that I hope that we're able to carry, promote, and hold highly even after the pandemic is over as well, or whatever our new normal looks like, because this is such an accessible way for disabled artists and people to connect. Um, we did some fundraising through art, my sibling and I. Um, 
due to time constraints, I won't talk about it too much, but let's get into talking about the projects a little bit. So last year, um, last at the end of last summer, I got some funding through Bricks and Glitter, which is an alternative pride organization. And I was like, I feel like we need a platform for disabled artists to be able to perform. And I think that that'll be like a really cool thing. And I thought that for myself, because I'm a drag performer, I find that digital performances are a lot more accessible for me because I can hone in my anxiety in my living room. And then I don't also have to worry about, you know, tripping over things or chairs in a club environment, or, um, you know, there's only one club in Toronto that has a ramp as a disabled person. That's something I always have to think about. And so I thought for sure, this would be a great idea, a virtual show featuring crip, mad and disabled artists. And we'll be prioritizing performers that are black, indigenous, trans, non-binary and people of color. Um, but I had to cancel the show because um, only two or three people applied, um, even when I extended the deadline and they were all white. So they were also not the people the show was for. And so I had to put out a statement saying like, due to a lack of applications, you know, I've decided to cancel the show. And I, I thought that the lack of interest spoke to, you know, the multiple pandemics that were happening. Um, every summer there is a huge bout of anti-Black police brutality um, and a number, like, you know, there was like the COVID pandemic. I feel like there was also a, a very specific um, environmental pandemic that we were also dealing with. And then also the fact that performance arts can be really inaccessible. And so I was like, okay, I'm gonna put this idea aside. Crip Cab is not happening. Um, and I tried to like think about, you know, how can I take this idea of trying to bring disabled artists together, but maybe make it more accessible, maybe make it so that they can invest less time and still be able to participate, need less equipment, maybe not need a camera person or whatever. And so I came up with the idea of Crip Collab. Um, I went back to my roots as an artist that learned how to make zines and that being my entry into community arts. Um, and I was able to build a community through Crip Collab. And the first issue of this collaborative zine featured 15 artists who were all part of the disabled community, also part of the 2SLGBTQIA community and everybody was black, Afro-Indigenous, Indigenous or a person of color. And we received over 40 applications. And so very much different from Crip Cab, the cabaret show, um, the drag show, because there was more than three applications. So this is the first issue on the left. This is the second issue on the right. Um, the third issue has been funded by Luminato and is actually coming out, I think later this week or next week. And this is a sneak peek at the cover. So that's issue three. Um, another upcoming project I have is called Digizine. And I, I just wanna plug that because I think it's such a cool program, not just because I'm running it, but because um, everyone gets paid for participating in it. Um, so you get $50 for participating in each of the five workshops. You get a snack stipend because snacks are very important to making art. Um, you get access to Canva Pro, you get hard copies of your digital zine that you'll be making in the program. And the program is specifically for people who belong to all three communities that I, I try to bring together in my work, which is people who are 2SLGBTQ+, people who are Black, Indigenous, or people of color, and people who are disabled. Um, because I feel like there are very few opportunities that are catered to and prioritize those groups. Um, and so this program is gonna actually be also prioritizing deaf and hard of hearing folks. So if you know anyone that might be interested, feel free to screenshot this and share it. You can also find like a square poster of it on my Instagram and such as well. Um, but yeah, those are kind of the things I wanted to share today. I know I've gone over time by a few minutes, but you know, thank you so much for listening. And I hope that there are some takeaways for you here. If you would like to keep in touch, you can find me on the interwebs in these wonderful places, um, on Instagram as Sticky Mangoes, on Twitter as Prezilla. And if you wanna see more of like general community things and memes, you can find me online as Prezilla. But yeah, thank you so much for having me. And yeah, I don't know if we'll have time for Q and A, but let me know where we're going. Thank you so much, Pri. Really, really loved hearing this. Um, I got to say, first of all, I love the shout out to York for the master's program. Um, and as an alumni officer, I got to say thank you for that. But we have several questions that have shown up in the chat. And so what I want to do is take some time to answer and, and explore with you. One of the first questions. I, I'm so sorry, Jennifer. Can I just interrupt for a second with the like, sure. keeping logistics kind of thing? 
Um, we, we're going to lose our ASL interpreters in five minutes uh, because they're very, very booked for Pride Week. Um, so I just really quickly want to describe for people how they can turn on closed captioning. If that happens, is that okay? I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, so for people who uh, will benefit from closed captioning in whatever way, uh, if you go down to the very bottom of your Zoom window, there should be a thing that says CC and live transcript. Uh, if you click on that and you then uh, scroll up to say um, show subtitle, um, then uh, you will uh, you will be great. Sorry, oh. Chris. This is one of the interpreters, Jordan speaking. Uh, I, I'm not. I can't speak for the other one, but I'm free after after one, so we have some grace. <sighs> Okay, well, if you ever need closed captioning, that's how you do it for future meetings. Thank you so much, Jordan. <laughs> I apologize for interrupting, turning my camera back off. Sorry, Pri, sorry, Jennifer. <laughs> no, no need to apologize at all. Thank you, Chris. So I'm gonna continue right on, Pri. Uh, it was one of the questions that I had too, and it's how, what is the origin story and how did you come up with the name Sticky Mangoes? Yeah, that's such a fun question. I love that question. Um, before getting into making zines, I had kind of been making little stickers with my sibling and selling them at their art table at zine fairs and things like that. And so when I decided that I wanted to kind of share my art in a way that people could find me and things like that, I decided to go based on sticky mangoes, um, because I thought I'd just be making stickers, which has clearly changed. Um, and mangoes because they're the, like the best fruit in bubble tea, milkshakes, let's see everything, sticky rice. Um, and also because mangoes have always been like a, like a, a visual of things being okay. And um, that's like a personal thing for me because my family grew up really poor and we grew up really food insecure. And so um, if my parents brought home mangoes, we knew that things were like, okay, like they're gonna be able to cover rent. We have like groceries for a bit. And so I wanted to, because I make a lot of art about food and of food as well. Um, and food justice is so personal, important to me. I also wanted to have like some kind of food element in it. And that's why I picked mangoes. I love that. I think that's incredible. Um, I too love mangoes and the fact that my daughter doesn't, it hurts my heart a little bit. I know, I know. It hurts my <laughs> um, you know, I love also that you have talked about your younger sibling and how they helped you to remember the passions that you had at a young age. I wanted to ask you how you found, how, how you can speak to finding courage in that moment because that's a learning and teachable moment too. Yeah, I, I would say that, honestly, it is really hard to do alone. So whatever existing support systems you have um, to, you know, really reach out to them. And for me, that was like my little sib and my partner at the time. Um, and yeah, so I think whatever your support system looks like in that moment to just reach out and be like, I really need a pep talk. I'm really nervous. I have to go like walk into this room and like, be a participant. And I'm almost 30 and I'm scared, you know, whatever it is. Um, and that's kind of how I, I got through that myself. That's perfect. And I mean, you spoke also a lot about Paper House um, and you spoke about family. And so some of the questions from the chat is that people talk about chosen family, but how do people choose their families? And then I'm just going to add to another piece, which is how do you balance all of your families? Yeah, it's such a good question. Um, it's hard. It's really hard. I think that I think that for me, it's about choosing people that make you feel good about yourself, um, choosing people that love you unconditionally, and also choosing people that don't put you on a pedestal. And I feel like that one is a little bit, um, I don't know, I feel like that one can be a little bit less obvious. But I feel like you need people in your life that aren't just enabling you. And if you're making a mistake, they'll be like, mm, maybe not. Um, and I feel like that relates a lot to also just doing anti-oppression work as well. Just, you know, being committed to ongoing learning and having people in your life that can call you out on your shit. And yeah, I, I feel like there needs to be, and I feel like you need kind of like a mixed bag of people, you know, folks that can just like 
coddle you when you need to be cared for, people that can, I don't know, help you do your errands run when you need help with that. And um, I feel like for me coming out of that headspace of like, I'm too awkward to have friends and like learning that I can have more than one friend was like pretty big for me. And that, you know, more than one person can care about me at one time. Um, and yeah, I would just recommend to prioritize the people that prioritize you um, and to just, yeah, practice reciprocal love and care in your, in your friendships. And in terms of how to balance them, I know that not everyone agrees with this, but for me, um, I'm very much one of those people where it's like, if it's my birthday, you're going to get like my, my paper house friends, my family friends, like my bio fam, you're going to get my, if I have work friends at that time, or my internet friends are also going to be invited. Um, and so, yeah, I'm one of those people that just like puts everyone in one room and then just like sees what happens. Um, because I feel like there's that common thread of, I don't know, liking silly stuff or art or whatever it might be. And for the most part, like it usually works out. I think even the shy folks I find end up like making friends with someone. And um, I feel like it really helps to come out of your, your bubble of friends as well. I really love that. I think having that support system, whatever it may look like, especially given a time like we are in this global pandemic, in a moment of such isolation that you can find families as you have through, through the web, um, you know, through the phone. And I think it's so incredibly important. We are running out of time, but I did want to ask a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, and they are as follows. What is your favorite art to create? And when you're creating that art, how do you practice this art making um, in community when you have people with a different range of skills? Yeah, um, my favorite art to create is usually watercolor painting. I find it's the most accessible for me. Um, I have a lot of wrist issues and um, I find that like you can hold a paintbrush really loose when it's watercolor and the water is gonna do its own thing. And um, yeah, so watercolor is generally my favorite. I feel like cleanup isn't too bad. It's not like acrylic paint where you have to like really scrub the brushes. Um, and then in terms of like practicing art making with folks in a, in a wide variety, with a wide range of skill levels, I feel like that's one of the big things about community arts and disability arts versus fine arts. Um, it's more about the story, the process, the learning, um, the feeling as opposed to what it looks like. And if it has, I don't know, good form or I don't know, whatever white dude painters say. Um, and yeah, I think it's more about just um, sharing joy. And I think that some of the ways that we do this is um, in very casual settings. So sometimes my pals and I will just like hang out to craft. Um, obviously we haven't really been able to do that over, um, over the pandemic, but yeah, that's actually how I learned how to embroider. Like I was just at one of these, um, we call them like stitch, switch and bitch nights at Paper House um, once a month, which are run by like two, like previous participants of the zine making program, two youth um, who run it. And so everyone just comes, either you play video games on the switch or you stitch and then you bitch and you just like, we just gossip and <laughs> eat snacks. Um, and yeah, I had some really lovely friends, Lila and Billy, um, who are both really amazing, who taught me how to embroider. And yeah, it's something that's like stuck with me and brought me a lot of joy. Um, and then in more formal settings, just workshops that are aimed at more like 100 and 101 level. And that's why a lot of times when I teach arts-based workshops, they're more at that level as well so that anyone can kind of come in and, and like pick it up um, rather than aiming for like a, a higher skill level. Thank you, Pri. I have to say, I um, really found that, you know, you found, you've given me courage because you just, in what you said, do the thing. Um, and sometimes I fear when you said you love watercolor, I'm really scared of watercolor because the water is going to do its thing. And I can't, I can't do that. But I find that art has become so incredibly important to me in so many moments of my life and especially now. Uh, and so it's just do the thing. And I think that's what I'm taking away from today. And I really do appreciate it. Um, thank you. And I'm going to welcome back Marvin. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. And thank you so much, Pri. It's good to see you. Um, 
yeah, I would I'd also think the ASL interpreters, uh, Cali and Frizzkid for, for uh, you know, sharing their, their stories. Um, I'm so sad that we have to leave, that it's the end, but we have more events tomorrow and I will bring Jin and Chris back to give you the rundown on that. Welcome. Hi, everybody. You, you start. <laughs> OK. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Marvin. What a great MC. Thank you. And uh, excellent. And um, thank you so much, Hannah and Pri and Callie and Jennifer also. All, everybody did such an amazing job. Thanks to everyone. Um, who would uh, Marvin or Chris, do you want to talk about tomorrow? Yes, I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm hoping that someone from the center can uh, post the uh, support things that are being offered at two today. Yes. And then also there are uh, other things, they're, they're different the different days, but you'll have to go to the, the website or possibly click a link if it's in the chat uh, in the next few minutes um, for uh, support stuff that's being offered for folks related to, um, related to Pride. Uh, so uh, Tuesday, which is today, Wednesday, Thursday, uh, from two to three, those events are happening. Um, also, every day uh, for the rest of the week from 11.30 until one, we have events similar to what happened today, but with different speakers. Um, so tomorrow is Wednesday. Uh, please correct me if I get any of those days mixed up. Um, <laughs> oh, fantastic. Jin just, just uh, posted a link. So if you if you click on the chat, uh, that uh, PDF will open up. It's like it's a PDF. So tomorrow from 11.30 to 1. Oh, and uh, Mark also did. So fantastic. Thank you both. Um, tomorrow from 11.30 until 1, we have, Wednesday, we have uh, a person speaking on behalf of Yiko, with a, which is a Ugandan, uh, uh, yes? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I was just being excited, Chris. I'm just oh, excited. I'm uh, youth, youth, uh, youth uh, organization, um, and then a local uh, youth organizer as well, named Alex Rivers. Um, we have on Thursday uh, Cassandra Myers and Lucayo Estrella uh, talking about their work. They they're both uh, spoken word artists, among many other things. Um, and on Friday we have. Uh, Kusha Dadoy and uh, Mocha Dawkins. Um, yeah, and we have Marvin emceeing all week, which is lovely and wonderful. And uh, Jin and I and uh, ASL Interpretation will all be here as well. Thank you so much to, um, to Pri and to um, Frizzkid and to Jennifer and to uh, Kaylee for all of the work that you've done today and see you all tomorrow. Happy Pride. And thank you Bye. to the center for all the support also. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. And thank you, thank you to our ASL interpreters. Yes. <laughs> Did oh, we forget sorry. anyone? Thank you, whoever we forgot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Happy Pride. <laughs> Happy Pride. <laughs>